Thank you all for joining us today for the Becker Friedman Institute's Friedman Forum. My name is Karen Anderson, and I'm the Senior Director for Policy and Communications with BFI. For those of you not familiar with BFI, we're a collective platform for the vast and diverse University of Chicago economics community, with almost 300 PhD economists on campus and even more scholars engaged in research relating to the economy, having an institute that can bring our scholars together around common research topics allows us to coordinate and leverage our work in a way that can have real impact. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Neil Mahoney. Neil is the Professor of Economics and David G. Booth Faculty Fellow at the Booth School of Business. He is also co-director of BFI's Health Economics Initiative, which is great for us, and a Faculty Research Fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is an applied microeconomist with an interest in health insurance and, as you'll hear today, consumer financial markets. Before joining the Booth faculty in 2013, Neil was a Robert Wood Johnson Fellow in Health Policy at Harvard, and he's also worked for McKinsey and & Company and worked on health care reform for the Obama administration. We're delighted to have him here today, so please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, Delighted that uh, so many of, of you are here. And what I'm basically going to do over the next 45 minutes is present uh, a research paper. Uh, and because you're a University of Chicago undergrads, uh, I'm going to uh, basically treat you like a uh, you know, seminar audience. Uh, so you know, some of the material may be a little bit harder to di digest, but I think one of the, the pleasures of being at this institution is uh, the quality undergrad students. Uh, and so uh, I hope and expect that all of you will be able to follow along. Uh, and so I should say this is uh, based on joint work uh, with co-authors uh, the University of Nottingham and the University of Warwick uh, in the UK. So the broad motivation for this paper is that individual borrowing decisions underpin a broad set of economic behavior. So individuals borrow to smooth their consumption over time. Uh, you may have even learned about Euler equations uh, which govern that behavior. Uh, people borrow to invest in human capital. I took out loans uh, when I was in college. Many of you uh, may be taking out loans for a similar purpose. People borrow to purchase durables, cars, houses, appliances. Uh, and because of the many reasons why individuals borrow, uh, understanding the borrowing decision is an important input into uh, economic models we write down in many fields. It's also directly important for consumer financial policy. And if you've been paying attention to policy over the last I guess it's been a decade now since the financial crisis, you know that uh, consumer financial policy has become an area of increasing attention. Uh, the financial crisis uh, and the roots in the mortgage market, I think, made the entire policy community uh, sort of, uh, interested in questions of consumer borrowing. Uh, in the US, we set up the CFPB and many other countries, other regulatory agencies were set up to think about consumer financial policy. Uh, and this is an ongoing area of, I think, deep policy interest and uh, where there's been an explosion in research in part because of the policy interest, also because of the increasing availability of big data uh, of which I'll be using in this project. So, what are we going to be doing uh, in this paper? I'll present, I think, one, may pa one main paper and then a related follow-up paper. So we have, we're going to be examining competing models of how individuals uh, make debt payments, effectively how they borrow across their portfolio of credit cards. So we have, uh, I think, is a, a unique data set with really rich information, so contract terms such as interest rates, how much people spend, how much people repay on about 1.4 million individuals uh, in the United Kingdom over a two year period. What's great about this data is we can see behavior on credit cards held by different banks. So 
Uh, in the UK, someone might have a credit card from Lloyd's and a credit card from Barclays, uh, and we're going to see their behavior on multiple cards. And then we're going to use this feature of the data to think about how do individuals allocate their payments, basically how do they borrow across their portfolio of credit cards. And we're going to be conducting a thought experiment. We say, suppose somebody repays, say, 200 pounds in a given month. Uh, how are they splitting those repayments across their portfolio of cards? How does that compare to sort of the optimal way to repay cards? Uh, how does observed behavior uh, compare to other models uh, that we could have in mind? And I should say the stakes for these decisions are, you know, not small. If you look at somebody with two cards in our data, the average difference in APR, that's the interest rate across cards, is about 6%. That's one third of the baseline amount. So these are you know, reasonably sized price differences that people are facing. So we think about this setting as a sort of ideal laboratory for studying consumer financial behavior. Uh, and it's ideal because uh, optimal behavior can be cleanly defined. Holding the total repayment amount fixed, it's optimal to pay the minimum on all of your cards and then pay as much as possible, allocate all of the remaining payment to the card with a higher interest rate. Because on that card, you're incurring higher interest charges. So if you repay that card uh, and not another card, you'll be saving, you'll be borrowing at a cheaper cost. Uh, what's advantageous about this setting is it's cleaner than many other consumer financial decisions. For example, if you think about decisions about what stocks to put in your financial portfolio, the optimal decision will depend upon your risk preferences, will depend upon your time preferences, how much do you care about having money now versus in the future. Uh, whereas this decision, optimal behavior, doesn't depend upon any preferences. It's very clean. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on credit card repayments because even within the credit card borrowing decision, that decision is relatively clean. For example, if I was thinking about what cards you incur your spending on, on average, it might be better to concentrate your spending on the card with a lower interest rate, but this decision is complicated by airline points or other rewards. Uh, balances on credit cards are the subject of spending and repayment decisions, and since spending decisions are complicated by rewards, balances then are complicated by rewards, so the repayment decision is really pure. It's a great laboratory to think about uh, what do individuals do? How does that compare to uh, optimal benchmark? Uh, if consumers are not behaving optimally, what other models can fit their behavior? So the first part of this paper is going to document that individuals do not behave optimally in this environment. It's going to replicate a prior study that showed similar behavior using uh, data from Mexico, uh, a critique of that paper, which I didn't hold, but other people put forward, is that consumers were or potentially unsophisticated in the Mexican market because credit cards are new there. Uh, and so perhaps the lack of optimizing in Mexico reflected that lack of customer uh, sophistication. The first thing we're going to be showing in this paper is you know, the UK is the second oldest credit card market high rates of credit card penetration behavior is very similar. So this seems to be a broad phenomenon. Uh, the second part of the paper is going to ask, well, if consumers aren't behaving optimally, perhaps they're behaving in a way, in a constrained optimal sense. So you could think about a model where consumers face some cost to be behaving optimally and will only behave optimally if the stakes are large enough. All right, I'm going to show you that the degree of misallocation is not decreasing in the economic stakes, suggesting that argument isn't right. And then the third part of the paper, and this is where the project got bogged down, uh, I think for more than a year. We said, well, we figured out what consumers are not doing, but that's not really an interesting paper. We'd like to know something about what they're doing instead. And so I'm going to show you, uh, you know, the result 
of you know, our investigation. Uh, and I'm going to argue that a balance matching heuristic, where consumers basically repay more on the card that they have higher debt, can fit the data. And I'll talk to you why this is actually consistent with a bunch of evidence from psychology. Uh, and we can have a conversation in the Q&A about whether or not we think this actually makes sense. Great. So you know, there'll be lots of caveats to the research, but a couple that I want to flag up front. Uh, the data allows us to measure allocation across the subset of credit cards we observe. We're not going to observe every credit card in a consumer's financial portfolio, so we don't observe the full degree of misallocation. We don't observe non credit card borrowing products. So again, we're going to underestimate the degree of misallocation. Uh, and we're going to be focusing on this thought experiment of holding my repayments in February 2019 fixed. Uh, what are ways in which I can reallocate them rather than questions about should I repay more in total on this car or on all my cards this month or less in total, uh, what we call the extensive margin. So if I have time, uh, I will tell you that, I'll show you some results uh, that basically replicate our bottom line result in the US. In the US, we have data where we don't observe interest rates, so we can't look at uh, the optimality of repayments. But we do have data with balances and repayments. Uh, we're going to basically use the same methodology and find similar support for the balance matching results. So whatever we think about it, it seems to be fairly broad-based, occurs at least among Anglo-Saxons uh, occurring in the UK and the US. All right, so I'm going to dive in. Our data was put together by Argus, which is a firm which provides data services to credit card issuers, probably other uh, financial service firms. Uh, like I said, rich information. So I see your interest rate, uh, other contract terms, how much you spend how much you repay. It's data from five issuers in the UK with a combined 40% market share. Out of curiosity, how many people here have a credit card? OK, so I, most of you are hopefully familiar with the basic features of a credit card. If you have a credit card and are not familiar with the basic features, maybe that's a good 10-minute homework assignment for after this talk. Uh, monthly data uh, over a two-year period, anonymized individual level identifiers, I'm going to analyze the data at the level of the individual month. Uh, so I'm going to think about that as an observation. For example, Neil Mahoney's behavior in February 2019. Uh, and I'm going to separately analyze the data uh, by people for whom I see two, three, four, and five cards. That's just going to make things easier. It's going to be easy to show you results for two cards. Once you understand the intuition there, then you can easily sort of extrapolate to a larger number of cards. Uh, and something that comes up, especially when I don't present this in the US, is people say, why do people have multiple cards? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that it's fairly common in the UK. Uh, about half of credit card holders have two or more cards, uh, and those people account for the majority of balances in the US. The numbers are even higher. So 71% uh, of people have two or more cards, and those people account for the vast majority of borrowing. So focusing on this reallocation decision is focusing on the people who are borrowing in the economy. Right. So I'm going to make some sample restrictions to focus on people who face an economically meaningful decision of how to allocate payments. So I'm going to focus on people who are borrowing on their credit cards. Uh, I'm going to focus on people who have different interest rates. Less than 1% of people have exactly the same interest rate. Those people don't have a economically interesting allocation decision. I'm going to focus on people. If you pay the minimum on all of your cards, then the only way for you to reallocate within my thought exercise is pay less than the minimum on one card, more than the minimum on the other. If you pay less than the minimum on one card, you will incur a uh, late payment fee. So I'm not going to think about those people because any reallocation is going to cause them to incur a late fee. I'm also not going to focus on people who pay the full balance on all of their cards. Because the only way for them to reallocate is to pay more than the full balance on one card, which is making an interest-free loan to the bank, which you know I'm perfectly happy if you want to do something charitable. But providing charity to banks, I don't think, is the highest impact thing you can do. Uh, okay. Resulting sample, I'm dropping a lot of people, but I'm not dropping uh, the majority of borrowers. 
right? So people who are borrowing meet these criteria. Uh, some basic summary stats. Uh, so if you split the data, look at people with two cards, you look at average outcomes on the high APR card and the low APR card. High APR card has an interest rate of about 6% more than six percentage points more than the low APR card. Uh, and you can already see in these data, despite this big difference in price, balances are similar. And it's not that balances are similar because people are right at their credit limits. They have a lot of headroom to reallocate balances. Uh, and so this already suggests something of a puzzle. If people are paying way more than the minimum, uh, but they're not skewing their borrowing towards the product with a lower price. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to refer to this cost at minimizing allocation as the optimal allocation. Holding total repayment amount fixed, it's optimal to make the minimum required payment on both cards, repay as much as possible on the card with a higher interest rate, allocate further payments to the low interest rate card only when the high interest rate card is repaid in full. And so hopefully this makes uh, sense to all of you. Uh, so what do people do? Well. The gray bars here show the optimal fraction of payments that should be on the high APR card. And it's not that everybody should put 100% of payments on the high APR card for two reasons. One is, well, you have to pay the minimum on the low APR card. Two, some people would fully pay off the high APR card, so then should allocate the remainder on the low APR card. But you see it's optimal to skew payments towards the high APR card. What do people do? Well, that's the blue bars. That looks pretty symmetric to me. Right? That there doesn't seem to be any concentration of payments on the card with a higher APR. Right, lots of other interesting features to these data, which we will talk about as we go. Right. So another way to just think about these data is to look at actual and optimal payments in excess of the minimum. So subtract out the minimum payments on both cards, and then ask, where do payments in excess of that amount go? And here, while well, it's optimal for something like 90% of people to put all those excess payments on the card with a higher interest rate. But what do people do? So again, behavior seems fairly symmetric. Something like 10% of people concentrate their payments on the high card with a high interest rate. Yes? It's just you have two products, expensive to borrow one, cheap to borrow another, so you should borrow on the one that's cheap. No, so that's what's great about this setting, right? Is that we're not, it's not like the you know, stock portfolio decision. It's very simple. Uh, and so in those settings, I would need to know your preferences to know something about how optimal your behavior is. Here, this setting is cherry picked, so I don't need to think about those issues. Uh, all right, so here's some facts. I said optimally consumers should allocate 70% of payments on the high interest rate card, 97% uh, of payments in excess of the minimum. If you thought that human beings were you know, monkeys and flipping coins and deciding things without thinking, you might predict that they allocate 50% of repayments to the high interest rate card. Better than monkeys, 51.2, uh, but not much better. Right on that spectrum, pretty close to random, uh, so consumers misallocate 20% of monthly re repayments, 45% of payments in excess of the minimum. Alternatively put, the vast majority of consumers, 85% should be putting 100% of payments in excess of the minimum on the high cost card, only 10% do so. Okay. So I showed you some behavior with two cards. What about people with three or more cards in my data? The way I'm gonna show you these uh, behavior is uh, show a bunch of radar plots. Uh, I had never constructed a radar plot before this project. Uh, you may have never seen one before, uh, but this is how they work. Each, I guess, vertex shows you the fraction of payments on average on each card. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the lowest APR card at the top. I guess I'll start with the highest APR card at the node sort of clockwise from noon, and then I'll go to cards 
in a decreasing order of APR, you see it is optimal to skew your payments towards the high APR card. And this looks like a sort of symmetric uh, triangle to me. Here are people with uh, four cards optimal to skew payments towards the high APR card. What do people actually do? It looks like a square. Uh, and here again, optimal people with five cards skew payments towards the high APR card. Uh, that looks like a pentagon to me. Uh, all right. So people don't seem to be behaving optimally. Uh, the first explanation that jumped to mind for me is these theories of optimization frictions, that perhaps the benefits from optimizing aren't large enough to rationalize actually taking the time to think about. So if under those models, what, you, what would you expect? Well, you would expect people with the highest stakes, you would expect them to behave more optimally, whereas people who have low stakes in the financial decision to behave in ways which we previously seen. Um, and I should say there's an active debate in economics about the importance of these forms of models. Right? When we see people behaving non-optimally, do we think they're behaving in a constrained optimal sense? So if the stakes became really large, they would behave better. Or do we think that they're just not paying attention? So even if you made the stakes larger, uh, they wouldn't change their behavior. So I'm not going to show you all the results in the paper here, but let me just show you a couple of them. Uh, I'm going to examine how mis misallocation varies with the difference in interest rates, bigger difference in interest rates, larger stakes from getting this right. With the amount of total payments, you're repaying more, bigger stakes to getting this right. And then I'm going to construct a measure of the financial stakes, which is the difference in interest rates times the total payments. And so that's the number of pounds at stake uh, from thinking about this decision. So here's the misallocated payments against the difference in APR. What would you expect if there were frictions? You would expect that people, people have 10 or 15 percentage point differences in interest rates. You would expect those people to misallocate, I guess, less. This number looks, this line looks pretty flat to me. Uh, this is the relationship between misallocation and total payment amounts. This line is actually increasing. Why is it increasing? Well, if you repay a lot, then, uh, the minimum payments are a small fraction of your total repayments. So there's more scope to screw up. And so people are actually screwing up more when the stakes are larger. Here's the relationship between misallocation and the financial stakes. Financial stakes are the product, basically, of the two previous graphs you saw. So they are slightly increasing because the second graph is increasing. Okay. So what are the costs of this misallocation? Uh, so I'm going to think about the thought exercise where people took their balances and shifted as much as possible to the high interest rate card. And they were in this new steady state. How could you achieve that steady state? Well, if your card allows a balance transfer, you could do it. Maybe you could achieve it over the course of a number of months of making payments uh, and spending on the correct card. Uh, but suppose you got there. Lots of ways to get there. How much would you save? Uh, well sort of depends. Right? If you're not borrowing a lot on your cards, you're not going to save a lot. If you are borrowing a lot on your cards, then there are lots of savings because we saw that the degree of misallocation is invariant to the economic stakes. So for example, if you look at people with only two cards, mean savings is pretty small, 64 pounds a year, but some people could save a lot if they're borrowing a lot. If you look at people with five cards, right, now these become you know, economically significant amounts. A uh, tale of people could save uh, almost 1,000 pounds a year. And remember, I'm only looking at people who have cards with these five issuers, right? which is 40% of the market. So think that most of, most of these people have cards that are not in my data set. They have non-credit card borrowing products. So reasonable financial stakes from uh, making better decisions. So taking stock of the evidence so far, credit card repayments are highly non-optimal, robust to samples with multiple cards. Behavior is inconsistent with optimization frictions. The degree of misallocation is invariant to the economic stakes. Uh, costs of misallocation are heterogeneous, low for people with little at stake, larger for people with more at stake. Uh, and estimates are lower bound because we're only looking at a fraction 
of people's portfolios. So this is where we got bogged down. People aren't behaving optimally. People aren't behaving in sort of the natural alternative model. What are people doing instead? Uh, and uh, when you get bogged down in research, there's also a lot of upside risk. And you can figure out something uh, that perhaps people haven't known before. Uh, so what are the other things we explored? So the first thing that actually pops sort of out of the graph is that a bunch of people are paying the exact same amount on each card. Right? So this is 50% on the high APR card, 50% on the low. And this is reminiscent of work by my colleague Dick Thaler, which has shown that people in a uh, retirement context might split their savings across different retirement products. So Dick Thaler has coined this, the 1 over n rule. Uh, and you can think about this as a 1 over n type rule in this setting. Uh, so if you look at this plot, about 8% of people seem there, there's excess mass of 8%, more than you would expect, at this 50-50 amount. So first we said, OK, that's fine. We've explained what 8.5% of people are doing. But then we realized, well, it's actually a little bit more complex. Uh, so one thing that makes it more complex is rounding. So to help you, or one thing that could give rise to this pattern is if individuals are using some other rule and then round their repayment amounts. So suppose some other rule led me to want to repay 220 on the high APR card and 180 on the low APR card, but then I like to round my repayments to multiples of 50, then would end up repaying 200 on each card. This would look like 1 over n behavior, but the underlying rule would be something else. Right? And this is similar to how I tip at restaurants. I have some underlying rule of 20% you know, for good service, 15% for fine service. But then you know, I will round so the total amount is a whole number, or the tip amount uh, is a whole number. Right? And so that phenomenon, or the analog of that phenomenon in this setting, could lead to people paying the exact same amount on each card. So are people rounding? Yes. Uh, this is just a density plot of payments in pounds. And you can see what economists call heaping at 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 250, 300. And people like to repay these round number amounts. 20% uh, take on multiples of 100. 33 take on multiples of 50. Uh, and what's interesting then is if you look at the histogram of repayments split by whether people are paying round number amounts or non-round number amounts, you find that all of this 50-50, not all, nearly all of this 50-50 behavior is for the people repaying round number amounts. So what do we make of it? Well, maybe nearly all of this 50-50 behavior is due to rounding. This chart implies nobody is paying, virtually nobody is paying 80 pounds on both cards, or 75 pounds on both cards. Sort of weird. If you think people want to repay the exact same amount on each card, why wouldn't they be repaying the exact same amount when those aren't multiples of 50? So that's one interpretation. There's little true splitting behavior. Of course, another interpretation is the people who round are different from the people who don't round. And those people, even if you said you're not allowed to submit a round number payment amount, they would submit you know, 8250 on both of their cards. So we can't reject uh, that 8.2% you know, of people uh, intend to behave in this way. Indeed. Uh, it could be that some people are trying to repay the same amount on each card, and one card is due you know, February 10th, and one is due February 20th, and they, get, they don't get them exactly the same, but that's their intention. So then you could think that you know, even a larger fraction of people are intending to make the exact same payments on both cards. Right, so that's sort of where we are with that explanation. Explanation one. Explanation two. Uh, and as you know from the title, this is the one which we think carries the most water. Uh, it's one where people pay more on the card on which more is owed. So in particular, the share of repayments on each card 
uh, is equal to the share of balances on each card, what we call balance matching. This is that statement in math. We apply some constraints so people aren't paying more than the full amount or less than the minimum. The constraints rarely bind, so it doesn't matter. Why? Why would people be making larger payments on cards with larger balances? Well, so one of my co-authors is a psychologist, so he was the person who originally proposed this. So argument involved two elements. First, if you look at a credit card statement, the balance is the most salient object on that statement. The I is in these studies where they track eye movements, eyes typically go to the top left. Uh, at least, you know, I think people who uh, have languages which are written from the top left downwards, uh, and you see that the balance is the most salient piece of information on one of my co-author's statements. Uh, he's not borrowing, that's good. Uh, the other feature is that there's actually a large literature in psychology, which I have become aware of, which shows that people engage in sort of matching behavior not just people, uh, species behave in matching behavior in a range of different environments. And so, uh, so the first paper in this area is a paper by Hernstein who's looking at pigeons who are trained to peck keys which would deliver food. I think it was sugar water. Uh, and the pigeons had two options, one key which they pecked and delivered sugar water fairly quickly, and one key which they pecked and delivered sugar water at a delay. Pigeons like sugar water, so it is a strictly dominant strategy for them to peck the key which gives them sugar water sooner. Then they can consume more. But pigeons didn't behave in that manner. They pecked the keys in proportion to their response time. It's sort of strange, but replicated across rats, fish, and humans. A related series of experiments, they ask human beings to uh, make bets uh, and choose between basically two gambles. And they can choose, they choose a, a large number of times. One gamble might pay off 70% of the time, another gamble might pay off 30% of the time. Again, a strictly dominant strategy to put all your chips on the gamble that pays off 70% of the time. Uh, and what people seem to be doing is betting on the option that pays off 70% of the time, 70% of the time. So engaging in probability matching. There's 22 experiments which have found uh, evidence of this you know, to varying degrees. So we see balance matching as sort of an analog to this of skewing behavior behaving in proportion to a salient feature of the environment even when optimal behavior is a corner solution. Right here, optimal behavior concentrating on the 70%, always pressing the key that delivers sugar water the quickest. Right, so it's somewhat reminiscent of these results. Also going to consider a bunch of other heuristics. Uh, take them to the data. Pay down the card with the lowest capacity. So suppose you're scared of going over the credit limit. One card is close to the credit limit. You might think that a reasonable strategy is just to concentrate your payments on that card. Pay down the card with the highest capacity. Suppose you want to free up space for a large purchase. You don't think you can use multiple credit cards at a store. You might want to pay down the card which is close, which has the largest difference between the credit limit and the current balance. You may want to pay down with a card with the highest balance. Suppose you have some aversion to having a particularly large balance on a given card rather than thinking about your debt across your entire portfolio. Don't know why that would be the case, but it might be a reasonable hypothesis. Finally, heuristic four, we were actually uh, bullish about this, but I'll show you it doesn't work well in practice. Pay down the card with the lowest balance. So this is known as the debt snowball method. If you pay down the card with the lowest balance, uh, you will, that's the quickest way to fully eliminate the balance on one card. Uh, and Dave Ramsey, who's a syndicated radio host, argues that will set off a sort of positive chain reaction. Right, that, that one debt is out of your life for forever. Soon the next debt will follow and then the next. These little wins give you the confidence boost. You'll see your plan is working and stick to it. Right, so you thought maybe we would say behavior consistent with that. So what are we going to do to test these different models? We're just going to look at the goodness of fit. What is the difference between 
predicted behavior under the model and observed behavior in the data. Uh, and we're going to use, well, I'm going to show you results using one statistical approach, which is just take different measures of goodness of fit, the root mean square error, mean absolute error, and the correlation between observed and predicted behavior. I'm not going to show you uh, results where we determine the best fit model on an observation by observation basis. Uh, and I should say these models, or this approach, treats the models as anchors. So even when a model isn't exactly right, right it still may perform well, because it will have a better fit than other models. Right? We don't think that any model of behavior exactly fits what humans beings do. Right? This is economics, not physics. Uh, OK, so let me show you some results for balance matching. Uh, the plots on the right show a, a contour plot of the density of uh, predict or predicted payments under balance matching and actual payments on the high APR card. The plots on the left show the marginal distribution, so histograms of predicted and actual behavior. You can see this is looking at the non-round number sample. These are people who don't pay round number amounts. I'll show you the other samples later. You can see there's a strong correlation. Right? There's a lot of mass along the diagonal. You can see the marginal distributions fairly similar. This shows you round number payment amounts. And these streaks are people uh, heaping at 50-50 or one-third, two-thirds, two-thirds, one-third. Uh, but you can see still there's this correlation. This shows you the full data. And again, there's a correlation. The histograms are similar, not perfect. They obviously don't miss. Or the balance matching is not going to capture this heaping, for example, at 50-50. What about balance matching on three or more cards? Here I'm going to show you radar plots like you saw before, except now I'm going to organize the cards from the highest balance to the lowest balance. Uh, the blue triangles are actual behavior. The gray triangles are predicted behavior under balance matching. Also going to show you uh, density plots of the share of payments on the highest APR card that are predicted and that are actually observed. So this is three, uh, three cards. Fit isn't perfect, but it is much better than the fit you saw for optimal behavior. Uh, here's four cards, and fit is pretty close. Uh, and here's five cards. Right? So this model is doing a better job of predicting behavior. Uh, how are we going to do this? I showed you some plots. How are we going to do this more formally? Uh, going to measure, like I said, the goodness of fit using these different metrics, root mean square error, mean absolute error, P Pearson's row, or the correlation. Uh, and to interpret these numbers, right, if I told you root mean square error of 62, you wouldn't know how to think about it. So what I'm going to do is create some benchmarks, which is going to allow us to think about the performance of the models I wrote down relative to things which hopefully have some meaning for you. So as a lower benchmark, I'm going to calculate goodness of fit under the assumption that actual behavior was drawn from a uniform distribution of 0 to 100% of payments on the high APR card. If your model can't do better than this, it's a pretty crappy model. right? This has no uh, economic sense to it. Uh, as an upper benchmark, I'm going to take uh, the data we use for our heuristics, so APR, credit limits, uh, balances, probably missing something. I'm going to just throw it into machine learning, a bunch of different machine learning models. I'm going to say, what's the best a computer can do with our data? Right? And so the models could replicate balance matching. They can do even better. So that's going to give us a good sense of the upper benchmark. And I'll talk, tell you how to interpret this uh, as we go. So here's the goodness of fit. Uh, and you don't need to look at all of these, but I'm going to show you results for root mean square error, mean absolute. And the correlation coefficient results are consistent. Uh, right? These things measure slightly different things. So here's random behavior. Uh, optimal behavior, you see. So lower numbers are better on these two plots. Higher numbers are better on this plot. Optimal is fairly close to random. Uh, does much better in the correlation, in part because the random benchmark has zero correlation with observed behavior because it's designed to have zero correlation. Uh, so here are the other heuristics. Here's 1 over n and balance matching. 
and here are the machine learning models. Uh, don't need to think about all of these bars. The, the way I summarize this information is that balance matching, and sometimes one over n, but not always, is more than half of the way between the lower benchmark of random behavior and the upper benchmark of the machine learning models. The other heuristics and optimal behavior are less than one quarter of the way there. Right? So more than one half is not 100% of the way there, but shifting towards explaining as much behavior as a computer. Right? So that's what I said here. The performance of 1 over n is very sensitive to the measure. Right? It's not going to do well under a correlation coefficient because a correlation between predicting everybody does 50% on the high APR card and what people actually do is zero. It does better on some other measures because predicting everybody's at 50-50 means you can't screw up by that much. Right? Because you can never be off by more than 50 percentage points. All right. So I sort of already told you what was in this taking stock slide. A little bit about balance matching versus machine learning. So this is sort of choose your own interpretation part of the talk. Glass half full view of balance matching is that it's useful. It's easy to communicate. Reinforces existing theories of behavior, connects to probability matching, matching behavior. Might provide some intuition in a new environment. Trying to understand how humans behave in some other environment. Say, well, maybe they behave in proportion to the key most salient variables in that environment. Glass half empty, if you're trying to predict behavior, I use machine learning model. Be a little bit of a black box, but it performs better than the simple model that I wrote down. Not surprisingly. So preferable if that's your goal. One other thing, you can try and unpack the black box from machine learning. Uh, so in particular, you can calculate statistics which tell you the relative importance of different variables within that model for predicting behavior. How important are balances? when the computer's trying to predict behavior. How important are interest rates? Which should be the only thing that matters for optimal behavior. How important is it to computer if you just say try and predict things as well as you can? Uh, so I'm going to measure the relative importance using something called variable importance. It's basically the proportional reduction in the sum of square errors. So similar to the partial R squared, it's the change in predictive power. If you remove that variable, from the algorithm. You don't want to do this when your variables are highly correlated. I'm trying to predict someone's height using, let's say, the size of their left shoe and their size of their right shoe. I might say, well, size of right shoe is zero predictive power, which is sort of silly because it's the reason it has zero, it just has zero incremental predictive power once I'm already using the size of their left shoe. Don't want to do these things when variables are highly correlated. Our variables are not correlated at all, so I don't think it's a concern. So what happens if you ask a computer what are the variables which gives it the biggest boost? Well, sort of comfortingly and interestingly, uh, balances have the highest variable importance. The computer gets a lot of additional boost out of balances. And like I said before, what should be most important for behavior, APR, the computer says, eh, not that important in predicting behavior. Right, so, uh, some of them have a variable importance which rounds uh, to zero. Right? So this is consistent with some of the major results in the paper. Prices don't seem to be important in predicting behavior. So much for price theory. Uh, balances uh, seem to be, that was off the record uh, camera. Uh, balances seem to be hugely important. OK, so uh, a couple more things I'll show you and then we'll open it up. Uh, for questions. So I said I showed you evidence of balance matching uh, in the UK. To what extent is this particular to people who drink a lot of tea? Uh, so we have data. Chicago Booth has a relationship with TransUnion. TransUnion is a Chicago firm uh, based downtown. Uh, and they provide, they're one of the three large credit bureaus. Credit bureau data. Uh, doesn't have information on interest rates. Right? So we can't look at the optimality of behavior. Uh, but it has, or TransUnion has been in adding information 
on, has information on balances, has been adding information on minimum and actual payments. Right? So it's going to allow us to examine balance matching and the other heuristics, show you graphs which are identical to the ones you've seen before. Uh, so here is predicted and actual pay, predicted balance matching payments, actual payments uh, on a uh, randomly chosen card, non-round number sample. Here it is in the round number sample. Here's everything combined. Right? So these look very similar. In fact, if I didn't name my files correctly, I would have a hard time remembering whether these come from the TransUnion data or from the UK. Uh, here's three or more cards. The radar plots you've seen before, four or more cards, uh, not four or more, four cards. Here are the plots with five cards. And here are the goodness of fit measures, balance matching. Actually, in the US data, uh, does even better than halfway between the lower benchmark and the upper benchmark. Sometimes does better than the machine learning models. So, Taking stock, balance matching, similarly strong fit in the US, captures roughly three quarters of the predictable variation. One of ran again is sensitive to the measure. Other heuristics, less than one quarter of the predictable variation. Uh, other results, which I haven't shown you, balance matching behavior is persistent within individuals over time. So I didn't have time to go through that result. But if you think this is actually a feature of economic behavior, you would expect that people who engage in balance matching this month also engage in balance matching. Uh, next month. And that is indeed what we see in the data. It's uh, that heuristic and one over n behavior. So the splitting 50 50 on each card are the only behavior which seem to have a high degree of persistence. So this is a broad phenomenon. So, two slide conclusion, and then happy to chat with you uh, for the remainder of the time we have. Allocation of credit card payments is highly non optimal, not explained by some fixed cost of adjustment. A uh, better explained by a balance matching heuristic captures more than half, perhaps three quarters of the predictable variation in the US. Performs substantially better than other models that I've come up with. Doesn't mean it's better than other models that other people will come up with. Uh, you know, hopefully other people will work in this area. It's persistent within individuals over time. Those are results I didn't show you. Uh, it's consistent with these machine learning models which place higher weight on balances and very little weight on prices in explaining repayment decisions. All right. So what to make of it? A uh, couple things. Large literature in psychology which provides laboratory evidence of matching in related but not exactly the same choice environments, different animals, uh, humans making probabilistic decisions. So the first evidence we know of of matching behavior, I guess, among humans in the field. Sort of interesting. Uh, I think another area I'm very interested in policy. Uh, and so what does this mean for policy? Well, I think one obvious takeaway is it suggests we should make prices more salient, more visible. Put them at the top of mind of consumers because prices are the key variable in this decision and people don't seem to be responding to them. Uh, people at the FCA, which is the consumer financial regulator in the UK, are running experiments where they are making prices more salient, drawing people's attention to them. Uh, a second potential response, and I have to say I'm a little bit of a bear on this, uh, but it's to make uh, it easier for people to help consumers with their consumer financial decision making. So. Uh, there's this open banking regulation in the US which requires basically banks at consumers' uh, discretion to make their data available to these third parties who could then help them optimize their borrowing, could uh, advertise other products if they think you know, they have a credit card with a high interest rate. Uh, and that could help consumers make these decisions. Of course, there's no guarantee that if you allow consumers to give third parties their data, that these third parties will steer them in a socially beneficial decision. So that's why I'm not as optimistic about this as other people, uh, but it's something that could work. Uh, there is a startup in the US uh, who you know, I've been told uh, one of their funders read this paper uh, and thought this was a problem that could be solved, meet tally, uh, which is trying to help consumers in the US 
uh, rationalize their credit card spending. So you know, maybe uh, some of these problems will be solved. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is all I have. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions you know, about this research, consumer finance, uh, more broadly. Thank you again uh, for coming.